what I want to do in this video is to talk about the decline of Al-Andalus under uh, within, you know, as part of the Islamic Caliphate and um, how the Islamic Caliphate in its various uh, incarnations at the end of this time period uh, slowly were driven out of uh, Al-Andalus and that then created uh, the vacuum into which uh, the uh, Spanish Empire um, arose. So this is about the decline of, of Islamic um, state control within the Iberian Peninsula and how then uh, that lays the groundwork or is simultaneous with the process of the rise of the Spanish Empire. <clears throat> and of course, this is going to be very important for us when we look at Latin America uh, because um, the Spanish Empire had so much to do with the invasion and and occupation and total, you know, reorganization of, of Latin America and, and the really the creation of Latin America. Um, and so, and there's some important concepts in here uh, regarding um, racism. So we see how racism develops uh, really for, uh, you know, at least the way that, uh, that Peck describes it, you know, this is really the first legalized form of racism uh, in Europe. And so uh, that's quite significant. And um, whether it's exactly the first or not, it, it's a seriously um, well-developed legal policy, racist legal policy, which then, um, you know, of course, plays against uh, Africans and other people around the world. But for our purposes, most specifically, that racism plays out in the creation of Latin America. Okay, so I want to, you know, point out a few things that are that are really important to that story. Um, okay, because of course, in in the later section, the the next section of this of the course is going to be about the liberation of Latin America you know, through liberation theology uh, and just that sort of coming to consciousness that, that Latin America is, is an oppressed continent or an, an, an oppressed entire region and, and, and cultural uh, entity, um, Latin America itself is, is, is oppressed by uh, the imperialist capitalist order as um, as Lenin would describe it, uh, but you know we might describe it somewhat differently. Um, <clears throat> okay, and so I wanted to go back to this. I think I showed you uh, maybe not exactly this map, but a, a very similar map. And so here's Al Andalus. Um, right down here is across the Mediterranean is northern Africa, and so this is. Um, where Ceuta is um, is like Morocco, and um, this area in northern Africa right here is is called often called the Maghreb, which is just like the larger area that's more um, more densely populated than places a little bit to the south and to the east because there's the the Sahara Desert. Uh, out there, and so it becomes very sparsely populated, a little farther to the south and farther to the east. And um, and then this gap here uh, is the Strait of Gibraltar, so it's just that little gap that needs to be, be crossed in order to go from Africa into Europe as continents. And so uh, the Islamic Caliphate, of course, was very successful at, at fighting all the way up to, to the Pyrenees. Uh, there's a mountain range right here, and, and, and that kind of, that kind of uh, provided an, a natural enough border that uh, the Franks were able to 
to fight off uh, the caliphate uh, at, and draw the line there. Okay. Um, okay, so that's what, you know, the situation as I described it before. And now we're going to get into like, you know, the 10th century and that Islamic uh, cal caliphate order begins to break down. And the, the first big sign of that is uh, the rise of the caliphate of Cordova. Um, Abd al-Rahman III uh, was the emir of Cordova. So the emir is like a, a lower level, uh, like, a, like a governor within the larger caliphate. And within the caliphate, there are caliphs um, I think there were two at this point um, who were legitimate, you know, because they were like they were like the governors over territories that included uh, Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. And so these are like the three most holy cities in Islam. And if you're the emir of one of those, then you can then you you can claim the caliphate and claim to be the top level like emperor, uh, the way that we would think of it in Western terms. And so, Abd al Rahman the Third named himself Caliph of Cordova, but but that's not really a, that wasn't really a thing. But then, so it modifies the word Caliph, and and from this point forward. We'll see other caliphs mentioned in this area in in, in uh, Cordoba and the Maghreb in northern Africa, and that's just a a, a change uh, in the usage of the term caliph. Okay, but but they certainly were emperors of some sort. Okay, just on a smaller scale, and and you know maybe not properly caliphs from the traditional view of, of, of the Islamic way of thinking. So there's some innovation taking place, some political innovation, and this politically isolates uh, al-Rahman from the legitimate caliphs, you know, so it kind of starts to, it politically starts to break al-Andalus away from the larger caliphate. Uh, and, and maybe it is not, you know, in these things, it's never clear which one comes first. You know, there probably arose simultaneously that Al Andalus was becoming politically isolated, and and and, and uh, this move was was to address a, a, an ongoing issue. Um, And then within uh, 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 a couple of generations, you have the fall of the Caliphate of Cordova. So it's a very short-lived uh, political entity. So you know it shows that there are, there are probably problems going on for for a century or so. You know thing, things don't just fall apart that quickly. And so we have Hisham the second, who was a child caliph. Uh, so his father died, and he became caliph uh, very early. I think he was something like eight years old or something like that, very young. And oh, at age eleven, I have it written here. And um, and then we have Al Mansur ibn Abi Amir, um, known as Al Manzor the Victorious. Uh, his official title was Hajib within this Islamic political structure. Um, he's really in charge. And so um, he's the regent, as we would say in, um, in Western terminology, and he runs the government on behalf of Hisham. Okay. And, but uh, he's very aggressive, um, very effective. Um, he's called the victorious because he wins some important battles um, and and uh, really made the caliphate of Cordova reach the height of its sophistication in terms of architecture and 
and learning and, and, and lots of things. So there were a lot of things that he did right, but um, because of probably some larger issues, uh, eventually there's a coup d'etat in, in 1009 and civil war breaks out in the wake of this. And then within a couple of decades, the last caliph is uh, uh, dies, and and so uh, the caliphate, which is you know just in Al Andalus, uh, covering most of it, um, but we have some uh, king Christian kingdoms in the north along the Pyrenees that are that are uh, that are. Uh, you know, encroaching even south of the Pyrenees and further south. Um, but uh, for the most part, at least on paper, the Caliphate of Cordova contains most of, Al, of the traditional biggest extent of Al-Andalus. Um, but uh, what happens in 1031 is that there's uh, Taifa kingdoms that arise, and then a Taifa was like just a regular kingdom within the caliphate, um, uh, organized more along the lines of European kingdoms. Okay, um, and these emerged in this period of, of civil war. They started to break away and be independent. And in 1031, it's like okay, that was that was just like the turning point where, all right, these. Taifa kingdoms were just independent, <clears throat> but there's a lot of them, and so uh, and they're small, and they're fighting with each other, and they're fighting with the Christian kingdoms in the north, and it's a, a big free for all and quite um, quite chaotic and militaristic sort of situation. Uh, where, you know, in the caliphates before, things were relatively peaceful. So here we have a, a time of, of turmoil and, and sort of breakdown of social order. Uh, in, in the midst of this chaos of these small kingdoms fighting against each other and against uh, Christian kingdoms, and, and sometimes uh, an Islamic taifa would ally with a Christian kingdom to go against another Islamic taifa, you know, so it was very much uh, a free for all. Um, then we get the Almoravid dynasty uh, based in Morocco. So that's in Northern Africa in the Maghreb, Morocco's, uh, you know, a big, big center of population, even to this day, right? Um, and so that's the main, you know, population populated area of the Maghreb, um, and that's relatively successful. Uh, but um, but was not able to regain Al Andalus. So um, that was something that remained in northern Africa across the Straits of Gibraltar, and these Taifa kingdoms are still existing and still fighting with each other. Um, but then we have the Almohad Caliphate, who, uh, who, which is just another family that builds their own caliphate. Again, these are this is this new uses uh, new usage of the word caliphate, um, and they take Morocco in 1147, uh, the larger Maghreb around Morocco in 1159. They they. So they secured the northern Africa portion here of the Maghreb. And then um, by 1172, they've successfully consolidated most of the Taifa kingdoms, at least in the southern half of modern day Spain, um, within uh, the caliphate. So this is a return of order. So the, this. Uh, Amoad uh, Caliphate brings some uh, renewed sense of order to this very chaotic situation of the preceding uh, century. And one of these uh, Taifa kingdoms is the Taifa of Cordoba within the Omahad Caliphate. 
And so, and Cordoba is important to us because that's where uh, Averroes um, was born and then uh, uh, conducts his career within really the Taifa of Cordoba and the Taifa of Seville. And so, um, and so I want to spend a little bit of time just, you know, going through the details. And again, it's not entirely orderly. Uh, we see there's still a lot of uh, political intrigue and, and back and forth. And this is the kind of situation that uh, Averroes was working in. Um, so the Taifa of Cordova was captured by the Taifa of Seville, and that ended the Taifa of Cordova. Um, and then the Then the city of Cordoba was, was captured by Toledo and then, and then recaptured by Seville. So Cordoba is a city and, and then it had a, a kingdom uh, of a larger area around that city. And so the, uh, so the city of Cordoba gets traded back and forth. Okay. And this is, you know, during uh, Averroes lifetime. And so the Taifa of Seville ultimately becomes a larger kingdom, incorporating the older Taifa of Cordova. And so the Taifa of Seville now becomes the kind of uh, big dog of the Taifas within Al Andalus. And um, now it was originally captured, Seville, uh, that kingdom, by the Almohad Caliphate. Uh, in 1091. And then, uh, and then the city of Cordova was laid, laid siege to by Mercia, which is another Taifa kingdom. And notice that these Islamic states are fighting against each other. Um, but that was not successful. But again, this is all happening during Averroes' lifetime. So we see that um, during the siege, um, uh, uh, I think I have these dates mixed up here. This should be 1169, 1171, 1179. Um, but we see that, uh, you know, within Averroes' earlier life period before he became a, a judge, uh, when he was younger, uh, you know, the city in which he lived, at least where he was born, was laid siege to. And, um, and so Averroes, you know, finds himself um, operating ultimately within this larger type of Seville and going back and forth between the city of Seville and the city of Cordova. Uh, and all during this time period, we need to recall that the Crusades are going on out in the east in the Holy Land. Uh, as the Crusaders like to call it. Um, and so Averroes has this, this uh, you know, he's, he's trained in, in law and, um, and he's a philosopher, but this is often the case with philosophers of this time period is that they're trained in the law and then they're also doing philosophy, but they're, they're working uh, as judges or lawyers or, or um, or ambassadors or things like that. So Averroes is typical of this. And um, so he becomes a quadi judge of Seville in, in 1169. This should be 1169. And I'll correct that after I get done here. Um, then he becomes a judge in Cordoba, the city of Cordoba, and then back to Seville. And then he was a court physician for uh, several months um, in Seville. So that's you know, to be the court physician, that that's then you're the 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 physician, the doctor to the king, and that's that's a pretty important political position, um, as well as you know just being prestigious as, in terms of being a physician. Um, and then he returns after a few months to Cordoba uh, to become the chief judge there. Um, and, and has a good career. Uh, so that's, you know, an extended period of time. But then in 1195, he's put on trial and exiled um, outside of Cordoba 
uh, and his books are banned. And so there's some uh, political intrigue there regarding his philosophy, uh, where he got into trouble with politicians, uh, either politically or in terms of, of heresy. It's not clear, uh, at least as far as what I know. Um, and he's he's put into exile. He's found guilty and put into exile. And um, and then his books are suppressed. But by this point, um, not only have the Islamic scholars um, absorbed his work, but it's also filtered into uh, Latin European Christian uh, philosophy. And so you know, again, he's a big bridge between this golden era of Islamic learning in the ninth century, the 800s, and the, the flourishing of learning that comes about in the 11th and 12th centuries in Europe. Uh, okay, and then, uh, and then, the Omahad Caliphate begins to have trouble. First, the first sign of this is the Battle of Las Navas de Tolosa, uh, where the Caliph of the entire empire uh, was personally present and defeated in this battle. And, um, and the, the coalition army that defeated the Caliph was made up of Castile, Navarre, and Aragon. So these are the big, Christian kingdoms that are now effectively fighting against the caliphate. And it's from these three kingdoms that the Spanish empire uh, eventually is consolidated. So these are big players. Um, and so uh, not too long after that, there's a coup d'etat in back in Morocco, and um, we have a rebellion in uh, following that coup d'etat. And this is very much like a guerrilla type insurgency where they're living in the mountains and, and raiding and using unconventional warfare. Um, and this rebellion is heavily assisted by Castile, that, that Christian kingdom. So this Christian kingdom is helping the rebellion against the caliphate. And, um, and so, you know, there's a very organized effort against the caliphate. And in the midst of the chaos, um, Leon and Portugal also take advantage of the situation to encroach upon the Taifa kingdoms of the caliphate and take some major cities. And, um, and, and eventually, the last Omohad prince flees Al-Andalus in 1228, so that none of the, of the, the family of the, of the caliphs is present in Al-Andalus. Al, Al and, you know, that's another sign of the waning of the uh, strength of the caliphate. And so the Ahmad Caliphate is in retreat. And there's this nice map here that kind of, you know, gives a graphic of that. Okay. And uh, so here is the Ahmad um, Caliphate including these other minor kingdoms. We notice that in this darker green in the south of Al-Andalus is Granada. So that remains very stable. So the, the uh, Taifa of Granada is able to fight off the Christians quite successfully. But uh, these other uh, cities, including Seville and Cordoba, are, uh, are, are overrun by Christian kingdoms. 
and, and Mercia that I mentioned earlier also. And this is Valencia. So these are just, uh, I don't know what language this is, <laughs> this is from, um, maybe Slavic. And, and so, you know, um, it's, a, it's still very chaotic, but the, but the caliphate is in retreat. And, but this emirate of Granada is able to maintain itself. And, and it consolidates some smaller Taifa kingdoms. And, and so it's uh, sort of uh, considered a, an emirate of, of, the, of the caliphate um, now thinking of the caliphate as the whole Islamic caliphate stretching across the globe. Uh, and we have this Nasr, uh, uh, Nasrid dynasty that lasts, you know, a good 200 years plus, 250 years. And so that's uh, something that's, that's quite significant and a successful remnant of the Islamic uh, caliphate within Al-Andalus. Now, uh, this emirate, though, was able to maintain itself by being a vassal kingdom to Castile. And so we have uh, the role of Castile, we see, is very prominent. And Castile has managed over these centuries to demonstrate itself as dominant. Uh, in the Iberian Peninsula, south of the Pyrenees, up to the Strait of Gibraltar. And one of the big kings of, of Castile is Alfonso X. Um, and by this time, Leon and Gal uh, Galicia are incorporated into Castile, essentially. The kingdoms still remain, and they, they would even have kings in them, but again, these kingdoms would be vassals to uh, Castile, and um, uh, and and actually, Alfonso was the king of all of these. But there would still be like governorships uh, within these areas, so they maintain their you know boundaries and and subculture and all that. They're just incorporated, like California is incorporated into the United States. Um, and Alfonso is uh, very cosmopolitan. He has um, Christians, Jews, and Muslims in his court. You know, his personal advisors are multi-ethnic and multi-religious, and he himself is something of a man of learning. He's, you know, his nickname was the astrologer, Alfonso the astrologer. And of course, astrology was um, very prevalent at this time. Uh, that was part of European culture, European Christian culture uh, was heavily in, especially with kings, were heavily invested in astrology, you know, because they still consulted the astrologers, you know, when they went to battle to see if it was a propitious day for, for a battle or whatever. Um, and, and so astrology is, is very important. Um, but uh, or I don't know, uh, yeah, I guess, but I want to say that uh, it's from astrology that we get astronomy as we know it, um, the study of the stars and, and all the knowledge that, that begins to emerge in the Renaissance and the early scientific rev revolution with Copernicus and Galileo, um, Kepler, these guys, um, in many ways, were themselves astrologers to some extent, uh, but what they began to do was to get more interested in the astronomy and really figuring out the motion of, of the stars and planets. But the original interest in the, in the motion of the stars and planets was astrology. <laughs> and um, this patronage of kings to astrologers to make astronomical charts to actually record the position of the stars and planets in the sky day by day and then make predictions of where they would be further on down the line uh, based upon that 
uh, and this is kind of like a, an artificial intelligence approach to astronomy. They just would record a bunch of data, lots of data, 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 and then they would try to see patterns in those in that data, and then predict what was going to happen. Um, and and so they had lots of data. They had lots of records, and it's those records that helped. Uh, especially Copernicus rethink things and then Kepler figure out some of the math of the motion and um, and then Galileo was able to refine that and actually do observations using um, using telescopes uh, to confirm a lot of the theories of Copernicus and, and Kepler um, but all of this was based upon those records of the astrologers Okay, so so this is a big um, a big thing. Alfonso the Tenth is is an important component of this, and and this is the rise of learning throughout Europe. Um, but there's lots of kings that are doing the same thing. So there's lots of data all over Europe about this stuff, and this is one of the pieces, though. Um, uh, Adelantados. There were these lords. Now this is um, oh, and and so the data is these Alfonsine astronomical tables. Okay, um, Adelantados are these advanced lords, lords um, within the feudal order. So you know feudalism is still up and running. Uh, Adelantados, this like avant-garde. Lordship was a special designation that Alfonso created, and he instituted in 1253, primarily granted to uh, men with military prowess who had proved themselves on the battlefield, and then uh, Alfonso would give them any territory that they captured and controlled, they would then have uh, land tenureship over that portion that they conquered. And so here we have the beginnings of, of, of the conquistadors. But now these are just conquistadors within the Iberian Peninsula, within Al-Andalus, as they encroach into the Caliphate and, and the Emirate of Granada. The these Adelantados, as they're called, they're not called conquistadors, they're called Adelantados, these, these forerunners, they're able to seize land and then become uh, official landlords of that land. And there's a special uh, legal institution that's developed, Incomedian, uh, Incomianda. <laughs> Um, uh, this is a legal structure, and it gave right to these adelatados to extract tribute from Muslims that, in these captured territories, the serfs and the free tenants. They became the lord of this territory, and they were direct vassals to the king. So this wasn't a sub-vassalage situation. That puts them in a fairly prominent position within the feudal order. And these are guys that kind of come out of nowhere because they're, they're soldiers. And so this is a way for um, somebody that maybe doesn't even have any claim to nobility becomes uh, a noble uh, almost overnight. And so uh, that's quite interesting. Uh, now in Comindia, that is going to be the legal structure imposed on Latin America by the Spanish crown. So this is very important for understanding the history of Latin America. Uh, there, it's this institution within the context of taking, uh, you know, taking El Andalus away from uh, the Islamic Caliphate. That's the original context, but then this legal structure gets applied out in the, the colonies of Latin America. 
Um, and there'll be more to say about that later. Okay. Um, I don't want to get into that now. Okay. Um, so then we have uh, another change within the caliphate, and this is showing that uh, the order is breaking down now more significantly. Um, the Islamic empire is, is dwindling and, and losing coherence all, through, all across the map. Um, and so the Marinid Sultanate, um, uh, you know, defeats the Omad Caliphate um, and, and sort of takes over that, that Omad uh, Caliphate. But it's um, a sultanate, you know, it's very independent from other Islamic political structures uh, because the Islamic empire is, is breaking down. So now you have this, this sort of pocket state that is on the model of the Islamic empire, but the Islamic empire is, is not um, as extensive and well integrated as it was in the previous centuries. But the Marinid Sultanate uh, makes a, a, an attempt to retake Al Andalus and looks and you know has the prowess to do it, uh, but it just doesn't turn out. The Battle of Rio Salado, um, they take a large army across the Strait of Gibraltar and uh, and I think I did want to show this because here's a nice um, graphic of the Strait of Gibraltar, so we can see. Um, and and the, at the narrowest point, it's only eight miles across. You know, so this is closer than like Catalina Island is to Long Beach. So that's a 26 mile uh, distance. This is like less than a third of that. So it's a very short distance um, that separates Africa, this is the Maghreb, uh, from uh, the Iberian Peninsula, modern day Spain. So they cross here with a very large army. Um, and they're supported by the Emirate of Granada, okay, and, um, and now Alfonso the 11th, this is the previous Alfonso the, the astrologer, this is his son, this is Alfonso the Avenger. Uh, and Alfonso the Avenger has his name because, for one thing because of this battle of Rio Salado. Um, and Alfonso here is uh, assisted by Portugal. The uh, Marinids are defeated within a half a day, like before noon, it's all over. And Alfonso and his his um, his knights and and troops slaughter the uh, the army, including civilians, um, even uh, women and children of the royal family of the sultanate. So uh, it was you know pretty brutal, but that kind of is par for the course in in these days. Uh, and so now the control of the Strait of Gibraltar falls to Alfonso. Now, this is Alfonso XI, the Avenger. And then um, Alfonso continues, you know, to, came, to gain that reputation of the Avenger by the siege of Al Jazeera Al Qadra, um, which is the last city down at the southernmost portion of the Iberian Peninsula. Let's see. So here's, it's on the, the northern side of the Strait of Gibraltar, but like at the very tip, like right at that crossing point. So that's, you know, uh, where the, the, um, the remaining, um, the remnant of the Marinids retreat to that city. And of course, get as many people across as they can. But Alfonso is able to put a land and sea blockade around the city. And this goes on for 20 months, a total blockade. Uh, Granada attempts to break, break the blockade, but is unsuccessful. 
Um, Alfonso is assisted by the Kingdom of Aragon and the Republic of Genoa. Now the Republic of Genoa is Genoa in Italy. So on the, the coast of Northern Italy, on the Western side of the, the main body of Italy, um, which is relatively close to Al-Andalus and, and Granada um, as by, by sea, by uh, the sea voyage. And um, so now Italy is being pulled into this conflict over the Iberian Peninsula. And we see that uh, Alfonso of Castile and the Kingdom of Aragon are, are in close coordination. And um, eventually after those 21 months, the, the Marinids uh, surrender and are, uh, you know, exiled and, and and put back into the Maghreb in Northern Africa. And the city becomes uh, part of the kingdom of Castile. Now, that is not the end of uh, Islamic presence in Al-Andalus, the Iberian Peninsula now. Uh, because the Emirate of Granada continues and continues to do quite well. This is sort of a, even a kind of a golden era for Granada. Um, there's several port cities. They have a good trade with Ge Ge uh, Genoa in Italy. And, and uh, Italy's like the main entry of goods into all of Europe coming from the east and through this route through uh, Genoa, or sorry, through Granada. And one thing that makes Granada strategically important to, now we're getting into the Renaissance era, okay? And, and this is where you get like the Medici's and the House of Borgia. Um, and, and we get figures like Petrarch and and uh, Erasmus and Thomas More with his Utopia. Um, that's this time period. So there is a flourishing of culture and sort of wealth uh, throughout Europe. And uh, Granada is doing great. Okay. And um, the, oh, as I didn't finish that thought, the reason why. Granada is uh, somewhat essential and in, well integrated into this new European order is that Granada is a source of gold for the Genoese bankers. So Granada has control of the gold coming from various areas across the Saharan desert using, uh, you know, uh, traditional trade routes of Islamic Muslim traders, you know, moving on camelback across the desert. And so there's a good supply of gold coming into Granada and they're able to offload that and sell it to uh, the Genoese bankers. And the Genoese bankers, of course, need gold in order to continue the, you know, to grow the money economy that's, that's beginning to grow at this point. Um, and of course, Granada is a refuge for Muslims fleeing uh, Christian persecution throughout the Iberian Peninsula. And by 1450, it is the largest urban population in all of Europe. Okay, so it's a flourishing city and great architecture. You, to this day, um, you know, tourists make a point of going to Granada to see the architecture, especially because it's heavily influenced by this uh, Moroccan caliphate um, tradition. And so the architecture is quite unique, um, very high and almost like almost seems to like float in air, you know, it's just uh, so elegant. <clears throat> seems a weightless in a way. So it's uh, one of the big monuments to the Islamic culture, uh, especially in as it, it remains and even continues to this day in in uh, Europe. 
Uh, okay, so that's 1450, and not long after that, the monarchy of Spain emerges. The monarchy of Spain comes into being when Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon marry. So they become married in 1479, and when they marry, they're, now they're the, she's the, the, the queen of Castile, he's the king of Aragon, and they combine their kingdoms in this marriage. And now they have the two largest kingdoms on the Pioneer, uh, Iberian Peninsula. The two largest have now become consolidated into one. And that's, that's the beginning of Spain. And they called it Spain. Um, all right. And they got right to work with the Spanish Inquisition. Okay. And so here's, uh, I alluded to it in the introduction, I alluded to the racism. Uh, we saw with the uh, uh, Adelantados and Encomienda, we saw that this is somewhat racist because it, it is targeted at Muslim territories, uh, but still is still tied into some notion of sh chivalry and and um, feudal nobility. You know, it's a different time period. Uh, but now we're really moving into with the monarchy of Spain. We're moving into the modern era, especially as Dussel, Enrique Dussel, that we're going to study in the last three weeks of class. He counts modernism as beginning somewhere around this time period, and. Uh, about 200 years before most historians would talk about modern Europe. He wants to play it's moder the beginning of modern Europe uh, in like the rise of the Spanish monarchy. And so, and, and he has some good argument for that and, and we'll take a look at that later on. So I want to kind of set that up here so that we have some of the details that that substantiate what he has to say. And one thing I also want to emphasize is the racist character of this um, Spanish empire from its very inception. Isabella and Ferdinand institute the Spanish in Inquisition. Um, this, of course, is is made possible through the through the um, the ordaining ordaining of the Pope, uh, but Isabella and Ferdinand are very much uh, in control of the process on the ground, <clears throat> and um, and it's brutal. The Inquisition had existed um, for centuries, going back to the early twelfth century, the eleven hundreds. <clears throat> it had officially existed and maybe even existed in practice a little earlier, you know, um, hunting witches and, and, and those sorts of things. Uh, but it was relative, I mean, it's hard to, it, it was brutal, okay, it was brutal and torture was used. But the Spanish Inquisition took it up several notches and just used most brutal forms of torture to extract confessions and conversions to Christianity and things like that. Okay, but um, but the but the one thing is that they really weren't um, initially they weren't interested in converting people to Christianity. That was not the point of the Inquisition. Um, there was actually a legal category of mudejars. These are subjugated people, and this is a name exclusively for Muslims who remain in the Christian kingdoms after you know Al Andalus is taken over by Christian kingdoms. These are people who are Muslims who remain and um, and and continue to practice Islam openly, they're legally protected. 
and so they're mudahars. Now, there's a lot of prejudice, um, just free-floating prejudice in the population against Muslims, but they are not uh, legally at jeopardy of um, being convicted of some crime for simply being Muslim, and, and they're, not, they're not a target or they're not subject to the Inquisition. They're fine. And we're not, uh, so they're not trying to convert Muslims. The concern of the Spanish Inquisition are these so-called new Christians. So these are people that had converted to Christianity recently. And so there were Moriscos, these are Moors. Um, so this term Moor is used for uh, people of North African descent from this uh, Maghreb, uh, ethnically from the Maghreb. So they're a little bit darker skinned and they practice Islam. And, you know, so there's this, this racial component to this. And the Moriscos Moors, as they called them, uh, like from Morocco, deriving from Morocco, um, these are Muslims who converted to Christianity because there would be a lot of social pressure on Muslims to convert to Christianity so that their their business colleagues respected them and they could, you know, attend certain public events that were Christian in character and not, you know, not be seen as an outsider and just, you know, get on the inside of things and assimilate. So Moriscos are trying to assimilate into Christian culture. Um, also, there were conversal, conversos which are Jews who are, simu are simulating into Christian culture and becoming Christian. So they're um, converts, is a literal meaning there. And, and Moriscos are under suspicion of the Inquisition and, and regularly brought before the Inquisition for being crypto, sec secretly practicing Islam, even though they've officially converted to Christi Christianity, they're still like, you know, doing their prayers uh, to Mecca or something like that. And conversos are suspected of being crypto Jews who are still celebrating the Sabbath and, and uh, the traditional rites, especially within the family home, which there's a lot of such things. And so if people even would practice things that they might even see as just part of their culture, just a certain way of doing family life or daily routine, uh, they can be brought before the Inquisition and tried and tortured and, and even executed uh, for these things. Uh, all perfectly legally. Okay. Um, now, the, the conversos were the main target. Uh, were, were, you know, there was more concern about the conversos. Um, and so this is one of the early manifestations of anti-Semitism, which, uh, and th this is a good context to talk about uh, that word anti-Semitism. Um, the Semitic peoples uh, are Arabs and Jews um, and some other people that may be somewhat ethnically, culturally distinct. Uh, the Palestinians might not be considered uh, genuine Arabs, but they'd be part of this Semitic group. Uh, and, and back further in history, there were other Semitic groups. But uh, largely, they're comprised of, of Arabs, people who are ethnically Arab, uh, not just speaking Arabic, and, and uh, Jews. And for example, like Persians are not uh, Semites. But so we're talking about people within the Arabian Peninsula and uh, Palestine and Lebanon uh, and that sort of area and even going down towards Egypt in ancient times. Okay, um, so anti Semitism is really technically or, or literally about any sort of, of uh, prejudice against. Jews or Arabs, but in modern American usage, when we say anti-Semitism, we usually mean prejudiced against Jews specifically. Okay. Um, 
the conversos were the main target and um, one indication of this is that all conversos were required to report uh, in 1484. By the end of the year, they were required to report to the Inquisition. Regardless of any evidence of, you know, them practicing Judaism, they were all put to the question. Every last one, uh, at least in principle. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there's always exceptions and people would, you know, bribe officials and things like that. Okay. Um, at the same time, there's this persecution of non-conversal Jews. So there, the Jews who were practicing openly and had not converted, were not subject to the Inquisition, but were being regularly persecuted on a grand scale. Um, in Toledo in 1480, the Jews were put into a special barrio, what we'd now call a ghetto. Um, and then we had Jewish barrios and even a, a, a night curfew put on Jews in Navarre in 1482. And then, of course, then we, by 1484, all Jews are put before the Inquisition. And then in 1492, this is the same year that Christopher Columbus invaded the uh, the Americas. Um, all Jews, all non-converso Jews that are still practicing Judaism are simply expelled from the country. So Jews were forced to either convert and become conversos and become subject to the Inquisition or to, to flee, just get out. And so this causes a diaspora of Jews all over Europe. Um, so uh, this is the origin of a lot of European Jews uh, from lots of different countries, because during the Caliphate, um, Jews were protected and they could practice Judaism, Judaism openly. And um, uh, so Al-Andalus had been a refuge for Jews. And there was a lot of uh, activity. It was a place where people were flocking to, like Granada uh, demonstrates. So there was a high concentration of Jews in the Spanish monarchy as they took over these Islamic areas. Uh, and, and, and now suddenly, they're forced to either convert or, or get out. And, and so these are very large numbers of millions of people, uh, well, hundreds of thousands um, uh, of people that um, are either forced into conversion or end up finding their way into Italy and Greece um, primarily, but then all over Europe. Uh, about the same time, the Granada War is taking place. So now the Kingdom of Spain is waging war against the Emirate of Granada. And it goes on for a decade. And ultimately, in 1492, the Emir, Mohammed XII, uh, surrenders to Isabella and Ferdinand. And now, that is the last official Islamic government within the Iberian Peninsula. So here is officially in terms of governmental structure, now even the Emirate of Granada is gone. Now it's all just part of the Kingdom of, of uh, Castile. And This is the same year that Christopher Columbus invades the Americas. Um, and I'll talk more about that in other videos. So that's kind of like the next story I want to talk about. And then, um, and then uh, a couple of years later, Isabel and Ferdinand are anointed the most Catholic majesties, you know, the Catholic king and queen of Europe. 
uh, by Pope Alexander the sixth, um, who is from the House of Borgia. Okay, and um, and and the Borgias uh, come from uh, Borgia in Spain, um, modern day Spain, um, and. Uh, and, and of course, the Borgias were known for corruption, especially Pope Alexander VI. Um, <clears throat> and then begins the, the expulsion of the remaining Muslims. So the Mudejar now are progressively um, expelled from Castile, from Aragon. These are the two major components of the Spanish Empire now. And so in 1526, by 1526, all Muslims living on the Iberian Peninsula had to either convert and become subject to the Inquisition or get out. And so this is, this is really the final nail in the coffin of Islamic presence in the Iberian Peninsula. The Spanish Empire systematically, in a racist fashion, eliminated Jews and Muslims from their kingdom over uh, several decades. And in this um, official uh, or, or this, this, this push by the Spanish Inquisition and the crown itself, uh, in the midst of this, there arises this, um, this concept, which then is applied in legal situations, but also just in institutions that aren't necessarily part of the government, but it just becomes widespread throughout the society, uh, is limpieza de sangre cleanliness of blood. And this is what Peck, um, uh, in his Exterminate All the Brutes, um, this is what he points to. I can't remember which part it's in, but you know he makes a big deal of, of talking about uh, this concept of racism that arises out of medieval Spain. Uh, you know, This is what he's talking about, is this limpieza de sangre, where uh, Okay, so I don't know exactly where things broke off there. I lost my internet connection, but uh, limpieza de sangre is cleanliness of blood. It's instituted in, in several, uh, most institutions throughout the Spanish Empire, and there, some of it is official and sort of legal, uh, you know, part of the government structure with titles of nobility or certain. Uh, positions as like uh, professors in universities and things like that, you had to have so many, and it depended on the context, what number of generations so was required, but, um, but you had to have so many generations of Christians in your family with no Jews and no Muslims. So it had to be no Jews and no, no, no Muslims for so many generations, depending on the context. And so if you were a, a, a converso, or a Morisco, you were barred from many professions involved with the government, but also from like craft guilds. A craft guild could institute uh, Lipienza de, de 
Sangra for just being part of a craft guild. Like when, when I was talking about burger production uh, in that Marxist schematic introduction to Marxist political ecology, uh, burger production is based on this guild system of apprentice, journeyman, master craftsmen. And even to be part of a guild that would certify you as a master craftsman, you would be required to have so many generations of, of clean blood. And so that would bar you from economic activity. So Moriscos and Conversos were um, barred from many forms of, of employment. And, and, uh, and so this is just massive institutional racism uh, on a grand scale that didn't exist as significantly anywhere else in Europe. The Jews were heavily persecuted. Um, Muslims were not very present in most of Europe in other parts of Europe, but Jews were and Jews were persecuted, but not in such a systematic fashion. Uh, and over such a long period of time, just consistently as a just a, a regular feature of the society. So um, very, very troublesome. Um, all right, so I, th I think that's it uh, that I wanted to talk about. Let me just take a look here. Oh, and but it is a little uh, contradictory and hypocritical is that uh, Ferdinand was the grandson of, of a Jew and uh, within his royal court and Isabella's royal, royal court advisors, uh, there were many new Christians, uh, Moriscos and, and uh, Conversos. So, um, you know, uh, that's, that's one of the things about racism. It's often applied very unevenly uh, to target the most um, vulnerable within a society. Okay. All right. So, uh, so that's that's that for this. And and you know, this racism thing is very important, um, not only for just understanding the history of racism, and, and of course our 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 renewed interest in um, racism in America with Black Lives Matter, but also to understand the experience of Latin America under Spanish colonialism. All right. So I will leave it at that and I will see you in the next video.